Welcome to Voice Rising with Cara Johnstad. Enjoy weekly conversations with leading luminaries, pioneering visionaries, singers, poets, musicians, and sound healers as we explore the profound role our voice plays on the path to self-realization and global enlightenment. The internationally acclaimed singer, composer, author, healer, recording artist, voice expert, creator of Voice Your Essence, and founder of the School of Voice, Kara Johnstad uses her extraordinary spiritual gifts to empower others. Everything in this world vibrates. Everything has a frequency. A pioneer in the field of voice work and transformational songwriting. Her breakthrough methods are helping thousands of people worldwide fine-tune their body-mind-spirit system and unlock the energetic frequencies of limitless creativity, health, and abundance. Share your voice, ask your questions, join in the conversation. Receive life-changing, positive transformation and rise together to create a sound world. And here's your host, Kara Johnstad. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Voice Rising. And I am here in studio, very honored, with a rock star medium, author, singer, songwriter, voice channel, Lee Harris. And we're going to dive into sound consciousness, into vibrational frequencies, into transformational healing, and into his brand new book entitled Energy Speak. So, Lee, I welcome you to the show. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. So you are a channel, you are an intuitive messenger. How did you come to discover that you had those gifts? Well, it, it, it was definitely something I, I didn't expect. Um, just to give you a kind of Cliff Notes version, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was at drama school in the UK and all of my childhood, that had been one of the things that I could do. I always found acting to be a very shamanic process. Uh, I didn't really understand that at the time, but for me, um, morphing into a different character in a story was something that I really enjoyed and w was able to do. So I was completing my childhood path. You know, I'd probably done 50 stage productions outside mm -hmm. my schooling by the time I was uh, around 19. And when I was there, it, when I was 21, I started to write music spontaneously. I picked up a guitar thinking I would learn the guitar, and then I started hearing these melodies and these words. So I always feel that that was my first channeling experience. And then about a year later, I heard the voice of my guides and underscoring all of this, I was on a really deep um, healing metaphysical search at the time, trying to, I guess, balance myself because I'd had a really tricky um, experience of being a teenager. And so mm -hmm. I was coming out of that, freeing up my expression, um, completing kind of the, the what had been my savior as, as a kid, which was acting, but also knowing that that was no longer going to hold me. Um, that that was no longer what it meant to me. And, and within a year, I first discovered music, and then I discovered the voice of my guides, um, just spontaneously one day on the train. Uh, and this conversation in my head just started. And so I, uh, you know, at first you think, am I going mad? What's going on? But mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. soon learned to write down the answers and the questions between us. And from that, I could actually study what they were saying and see the positive and opening effect it was having on my life to have these conversations with them. So that's that's how it all began, and that was 20 years ago now. And as a child, um, do you remember the emotion that seemed to be holding you back, that drove you into wanting to study acting and wanting to live more your creative channel? You know, it's funny, I, I didn't have the word for it as a kid, um, but now grief is, is the word I would give it, mm -hmm. a kind of sense of grief and loneliness and um, feeling other in a way that I think mm -hmm. many, many, many identify with, but unfortunately, especially back then, we, we weren't talking about that. So it was something much more insidious that everybody who felt that was living with, and, and for me, 
I felt that when I was expressing myself in, in, in a story or as a character, um, that I could breathe and that I had oxygen and that I was connecting with something bigger than me and also with audiences if you were performing. Um, that audience conversation was something that I could feel. Um, but yeah, I would say grief was the thing that I was really struggling with as a kid. And then I'm I'm fascinated as a singer-songwriter myself and also coming from acting. Um, how was it for you? You were sensing all these different facets of your uh, many different identities, maybe through the roles that the playwrights had written. You're on stage, you can slip in and out of different costumes. But when you start to songwrite, because that seems to be the stage right before this opening happened with your guides, it was your true voice that you were trying to channel. And what was the difference for you performing other words from other writers or um, other characters and other than stepping into your own truth and trying to put that not only onto paper, but to really give it melody and to give it voice. What was, was it, w did you feel more fragile or more vulnerable when you were writing your own songs or did you feel more empowered? I think, first of all, great question. <laughs> and I think both, I, I, I think, but I think that was it. I think it was, it was, it was alive because there was vulnerability and there was expression and I think, in a way, now I look at it, you know, the, the beauty of drama school for me was even though I went there with this kind of slightly heavy heart about it because I knew it was, it was hard to get in, they didn't take many people, they're drilling into you, you've got to take this seriously, my parents mm -hmm. had, you know, helped me go, um, I kind of knew I was going to leave. Um, so there was this strange thing that I was feeling, but what did happen for me there was they brought in many wellness elements. So we were taught Alexander technique. They came at it from a very psychological and um, spiritual perspective. So what happened to me personally at drama school was I spiritually opened. And mm -hmm. for me with music and with songwriting, there was this joy of discovering that I had something that needed to come through me in, in expression that I really couldn't do as an actor. And that was the other thing about drama school. There were people in the group who were brilliant. They were kind of like the Tom Cruise's or Julia Roberts style actors where mm. they could be themselves. And, and they were always slight variations of themselves, but they knew how to embody their own emotions, own their own emotions. I couldn't do that. So, you know, it was really fa it was it was it got very exposing to me that I was really a character actor, which was going to be a problem when you're a 20 year old. Um, you know, you're really good at playing Shylock. But when you get out into the world, they want you to be yourself. I didn't really have a strong sense of self self identity. So music right. was the first place that I really found that. And then, of course, going and doing someone else's words or someone else's story once I was through drama school, and that was very uninteresting to me. Um, at least at drama school, you were constantly, you were in this group process with your peers and you were being put into these stories. And of course, it always has a meaning for your life, whatever character you're playing, uh, whatever you are processing through the story of, of that piece of theater, you can find the metaphysical meaning or learning or lesson in it. But it, it was interesting how Definitely music was the first place that my soul got to express, I would say, my feelings. And then, mm -hmm. of course, when the channeling came along, um, th that was a whole new level of, OK, <laughs> let's look at this thing called identity and let's mm -hmm. let's show you how how big this is, um, this this thing of being a human being on the planet. And and that really started to help me understand why as a kid. I had felt like the lights were switched off on, on in in my life um, unless I worked to activate them because it was like oh the lights often are switched off on Earth and you have to mm. you have to find them you have to cultivate them you have to you have to bring them there are areas where the lights or the view is just switched off and rather than that being a struggle that then becoming something that I just innately could understand. Um, beautiful. 
Um, what I love about um, exploring your work, and it's not only for this interview that I was able to um, read the newest or, or your new book, Energy Speaks, I also had the great pleasure, I think about six months back, of um, uh, taking a or, or listening to you speak on narcissism, which I, I just loved what you were saying. I was like, oh. wow, it's so profound. And what I also love as a voice coach, I guess someone who heals a lot of wounds, is that you work on all the different layers of voice. So everything from the inkling of an idea, thought systems, intentions, affirmations, belief systems, the writing voice, the speaking voice, the singing voice. And I want to ask you this question because I can only ask it to people who actually understand how big and multidimensional the voice channel is and the vibrational frequencies that run through our body. And so it's not only our own voice, but you're also working with the collective voice and also many other voices, right? So it's, it's a very profound um yeah, existence that you've chosen, I would have to say it like this. So when we arrive on Earth, each and every one of us, each and every one of us, every single soul has that big, open voice channel and a voice which or where energy truly does speak, where energy truly does move through us and we're able to express our needs, we're able to cry, we're able to later on laugh, um, we're able to move that energy through our channel long before we can crawl or long before we can hop, skip and jump. And we're also able to move a room. If we have one little um, hiccup or one little cry, somebody, hopefully, if not many people will come running towards us. So we know what it's like to command attention and to receive attention. And it seems to me, I'm also a mother, that the kids that come are aligned with their truth. And so my, my curiosity is, when do you think that we start losing that um, body, mind, spirit channeling alignment? Do you think it comes with when we are given the power of word and we say that we don't want the spinach or that we do want to eat or that we don't want to sleep and somebody tells us, know you have to, whether you like it or not? Do you think it's when we first go into school? Because I have a lot of clients who whose biggest struggle is the wounds of having closed that powerful voice channel. So that's a question. If we come mm -hmm. from pure consciousness and we go back to pure consciousness, why the merry-go-round? Why can't we just land on earth with that big channel and continue to channel? Yeah. Right. right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, the, a couple of different things, and it's interesting. I just did some work on this recently um, in, a, in a new recording that will be coming down somewhere down the road. And it was um, talking about that it was channeling and they were talking about societal societal impact on us mm -hmm. as a soul. You know, we uh, and they were talking about the age of around two to three and mm -hmm. saying that that was a significant moment. But the other piece that came out in this recording, which is something I feel like I've been called to be a voice for a lot, is we forget how everybody's wounds are carried with them, even if they're invisible. So I think we can get very personal about our wounds and, and, and think about our past wounds that we're carrying with us into this party or this job or this family that we've just been adopted into because we're dating someone in that family. And what mm -hmm. we forget is that it's energy, no pun intended, energy does speak. So if you mm -hmm. go into a room where people are really open, really aware, really awake, and you can be in that room long enough to calibrate with that, you know, perhaps at first it brings up some of your stuff because that's what you're walking in with. But if you stayed with that group for a week or so, you would shift. And so I think that it's the wound in the collective that we're often bouncing and relaying off and we mm -hmm. over personalize it. Um, I say that just to be a voice for the other side of the multidimensional map of all of this, because mm -hmm. I think we do, we do have a lot of information and knowledge and study and learning around 
how to work with our original wounds, the, the times and the places that we close down. But I also think there's something to be said for, well, when you were 38 years old or when you were 55 years old, you had a breakthrough moment, something happened. And, mm -hmm. and actually that could never have happened when you were three because you didn't have the wealth of experience. So I think that the design of this planet is that we come in, we come in as open souls, and we are either going to be held open as souls because of the circumstances we're born into, or more often than not, we're going to interact with where soul is closed on the planet and have to work to either recover or reclaim that for ourselves, and then offer that to others. So I think the merry-go-round is not a failing of the soul. I think it's, if you like, um, the limit of the collective right now that we're all in and interacting with and impacted by every single day. So the more we own that open, beautiful channel that we are and that collective voice that we have, um, the easier it is to find resonance. Yes, and also that that's that the job that we're doing is far bigger than ourselves, even though we may never fully be able to grasp or see that. So we didn't just get dropped off on this planet by ourselves to have an experience mm -hmm. of soul growth by ourselves. So the Zs will often talk about that. They will say, you as a collective are part of a bridge period for humanity, where you are bridging consciousness at a higher level to literally change the world. Now, of course, I think you have to be careful of getting too lofty about that because mm -hmm. every generation to some degree has that um, path laid out ahead mm -hmm. of them. But but I, I think when it comes to soul expression, people like yourself who are doing this work for others with others, you are bastions and leaders of this truth. Uh, you're the healers of this area of life. And so that role that you've taken on you know it makes me think well Cara it's probably pretty obvious what you were doing on a, on Atlantis if we look at what you're doing now in terms of you know who you were as an energy scientist energy scientists are we so we're going to take a little station break and be back here in a couple of minutes with the wonderful Lee Harris talking about sound consciousness, vibrational frequency, and how energy truly does speak. The cutting edge of conscious radio, Om Times Radio, IOM FM. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Connect at omtimes.com. Ohm Times, creating a more conscious lifestyle. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living. A chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. With happy clients all over the world, Kara Johnstad knows that your voice is the missing link to more authenticity, abundance, creativity, and health. An internationally acclaimed voice expert, Kara's breakthrough methods have helped thousands of people successfully heal their voice wounds and extinguish the story of self-doubt and shyness forever. Join in group trainings, attend online sessions, schedule one-on-one -on -one time, and invite Kara to work with your organization and community. Get started today. Go to www.karajohnstad.com and receive a special guided meditation designed to fine-tune your inner voice and welcome you on the voice journey. Why is the basketball court all wet? 
Because the players kept dribbling on it. The dad joke. Corny, grown worthy, but also one of the simplest ways to share a moment with your kids. What did the buffalo say when he dropped his son off for school? Bye, son. <laughs> so take a moment to make your kid laugh because dad jokes rule. Make your kid laugh today. Go to fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Welcome back. I'm Cara Johnstad. You are at Voice Rising, and we're in studio with Lee Harris, author, medium, singer-songwriter, a lot of those good things, a leader um, leading from the heart. Um, Lee, we're living in times when the spirit is drawing closer to our conscious awareness and we're able to sense a larger array of emotions. And you have shared in your new book, Energy Speaks, that as humanity moves into a more fluid state of feeling, that we are beginning to, or we begin to notice that we are moving also closer to our own true nature. Can you share with us a bit about your understanding of emotions, energy in motion, and why they are so key to living our vibrant presence? Well, it kind of goes back to what you were saying uh, a couple of questions ago about how we stifle our expression or our soul at a young mm -hmm. age. And it's usually those first emotional impacts. So somebody tells us off, you know, no, you shouldn't have brought the drum kit out into the living room that, you know, that's that's terrible. So mm -hmm. suddenly you feel a shame because of the way that somebody told you off or impacted you. So you feel this emotion, you then will hesitate to ever bring the drum kit out again, ever, um, because mm -hmm. you won't want to feel that emotion. So we tend to bury these knotted or wounded emotions and we push them down and we create um, a, a thought around it that will stop us doing that again. So it's no different to learning what it's like to put your hand in fire or jump off a wall that's a little too high for you once you've felt the pain of those actions your mind will in future remind you that that's painful and it will say oh no no don't put your hand in fire before you mm -hmm. have an impulse to do it so i remember about 12 years ago um the z's were saying to me um the z's and my guides they said, mm -hmm. you're going to see the world become a lot more emotional. And in my naivety, I remember thinking, oh, how lovely. That was just lovely. Everyone's going to be hugging and sharing their feelings. And you know, I totally, <laughs> as, as is often the way with channeled messages, they, they can have multiple meanings. And of course, they're all about the perspective or the way that you see them at the time. So for me, what's going on right now is this unraveling of emotions just as we're seeing an unraveling of, if you like the world as we knew it. So the world that we do believe in, feel safe, um, feel was holding us in a structure that was working, isn't. And so as, that's, as that happens outside us, as uncertainty grows outside us, whether that's environmentally, politically, economically, um, or, or even spiritually, people often go through their spiritual crisis or spiritual wake-up call when any of those things wobble or um, are no longer holding people in place in quite the same way, then your emotions rise. So for me, there's a twofold process going on. There are people who have perhaps never felt things or the way they feel about life right now having an all new level of feeling. And then there are, you know, kind of the old guard, those of us who perhaps have explored feeling consciously for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, going through quite big waves of healing ourselves. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm hearing this very commonly from other friends, colleagues, teachers I know, um, saying, wow, I'm really, I'm going through some stuff here and I, mm -hmm. I haven't felt the acceleration. And so I think it's hitting all of us. Um, it's unavoidable because we're in transformation. Um, it can be very uncomfortable but of course, what we do know is that, you know, when, when we go through these uncomfortable releases, we get to the other side. I think the relentlessness of it in the last, let's say, decade has been surprising to many people who had got, got accustomed to perhaps a gentler speed of healing 
or less of a mass healing. Um, because even though people are at different levels of consciousness on the planet right now, I think more than ever before, we as a collective are aware that as a society, we're going through something really huge. And whether people are focusing on that because of politics, economics, the environment, or spirituality, there is more of a unification around that truth than I've certainly ever seen in my lifetime. Yeah, I agree. And I was just uh, contemplating your thoughts also on sound and silence, because, you know, the inner voice, when we're going deeper into silence, we have that opportunity to reflect. But a lot of times people on the spiritual path um, don't maybe or they need the tools to also express those deeper layers of emotion and give them sound. And how do you see voice work facilitating. I know you've done a lot of also, not only are you a singer songwriter, and I know that, you know, that might be a little bit put to the side in the moment with the book release and everything, but I know that it's something that is dear to you, but you also do a lot of audio recordings to support thousands of people. So your voice is very present. Um, your voice work for yourself, but also in other people's lives is also very present. How do you see voice work making audible our feelings as an important tool for to facilitate healing? Well, you know, I'm a I'm a huge lover of chant. I didn't I didn't discover Kirtan until 2012. I was invited to sing with a Kirtan artist on a couple of songs, Brenda McMorrow, and mm -hmm. um, I remember being in the room that night and I was like oh my god what is this this is so good you know just a room full of people mm -hmm. chanting together so there's there's the collective release um, that's one side of it I guess in some ways I feel like my biggest job is to be a translator for those feelings or, or perhaps to be a kind of conversation starter around expression the irony mm -hmm. for me is I use my voice um, very much in my work um, and and speak but I, I always say that what I'm saying is what I'm listening to whether it's the guides whether it's the person in front of me in the workshop room whether it when I'm I record these monthly videos free videos mm -hmm. on YouTube called energy updates and I speak in those non-stop for about 15 minutes but really what I'm doing is saying what I'm hearing um, when I tune in on the collective. So mm -hmm. what I've noticed is affirmations, um, singing, you know, that's one of the things I, I always say to people. I'm like, if you're feeling stuck, just just walk around the house and sing a few words, see how it <laughs> sounds when you put some music to it, you know, just because it mm -hmm. breaks that, that up yeah. and it helps break up the mental pattern. I mean, I know you know this because you're a teacher yes. of this, but yeah. so, so it, it's interesting. Uh, I, I would say that I definitely lean into um, music and sound of others, music of others to help me feel, to help me move what I'm feeling. Um, mm -hmm. And so I feel like in my own job, my job is often to be a, a translator to perhaps give words to something that other people might be feeling inside themselves that then ignites a, a deeper conversation. If they hear something on an energy update, and then they start talking to their friends about it or they leave a comment about it, it helps them start a conversation with their own inner voice um, and express that. Because, you know, my truth, Kara, is when I was not expressing myself, I was in all kinds of trouble. You know, I was mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I was overeating, then I was bulimic. Um, so I think if, if we stifle our expression, we're in trouble. Right, that's probably where the whole depression, suppression, <laughs> all those things come and the key is expression, right? Yes, I also have seen yes. that you do lovely um, energy paintings also, moving energy through mm. color and and uh, uh, artwork, fine artwork. Yeah, 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 yeah it's very it's, therapeutic. Also because it's yeah. free of words, <laughs> so because so much of my work has has become word oriented i really i really love the visual um in that way well that's a fascinating thing too right words can be so powerful they can 
bring us, take us to a deeper level. And words can also be so misunderstood. I mean, we can, you know, with a few words properly aligned with our heart and love, you can move a whole room of people or you can heal a wound in, in you know, your, your lover comes with a, a story and a few kind words and they're transformed. At the same time, a few harsh words and somebody can be destroyed for many, many years. They can carry this wounding with them for many years through words. And I've, I've always, you know, there's always been another fascinating question, you know, what is, what is better to seek the um, seed sounds and to, to come into only pure toning? Or is it powerful also to really dig down deep and see what is our truth if we put it into words, right? Or is it a mixture of all and the above? Maybe. Well, it's like interesting. Some, yeah. uh, I think it's funny listening to you. I, I, and I, I'm sure people listening might connect with this. There are times I need to listen to Nils Fram because mm -hmm. he's not going to be singing, but his piano is. And there isn't going to be a human expression. There's going to be a human using an instrument to express. Mm -hmm. And then there are other times I need to listen to Tori Amos because I need right. to hear and f hear her words and feel her vibration helping us process something that's very human oriented that she mm -hmm. has put to music so mm -hmm. I, I for me it's kind of it, it's it's all of the above because the other aspect of what you're saying is tone so somebody can say i love you and mm -hmm. somebody can say i love you and then mm -hmm. you know that same exactly. three words and two completely different tones and I think the work you do is so important because I do meet people and come across this where certain people have not yet either been shown or figured out that their use of language is something they're holding quite far away from their soul. You mm -hmm. know, somebody who is not necessarily aligned with their words and their tone. It's almost like they have either been taught or trained that words are this distant thing. So they aren't really inhabiting what they're saying. Um, and, I, and I think when, when people learn to inhabit what they're saying through exercises, through workshops, I know for me going to drama school and having those kinds of trainings, they did all kinds of things to push and pull you around. Um, it really does start to put you back in alignment in a way that uh, that, that I don't think is society-wide. It's something you you tend to have to go and seek for yourself, especially if you feel that expression is missing in your life. I feel like I've gone off on a tangent there, Cara, but I oh, think no, you know no what worries, I mean. No worries. Lee, you say in the first chapter of your new book, and for everybody out there, the new book is entitled Energy Speaks, you say the chapter is um, titled You Are a Light Worker. So maybe you can... And some people understand that term light worker. Other people might be just being introduced to it. So what is a light worker for you? And how can you, or how can someone know that they are a light worker? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the thing about the idea of a light worker for me is my truth is a light worker is someone who brings some light, some love, some connection, some help. And mm -hmm. I see those people all the time, like, I always say it's the person who smiles at you in the coffee shop when you're having either a rough day or you're not really awake yet, but they just give you this big warm smile and you mm -hmm. feel it and it transmits. Um, it's, the, it's, the, it's the nurse who is taking your blood for a blood test and it's just very kind and reassuring and, and there's something about them that is warm. So to me, I think light workers are everywhere. Those who identify as light workers or who who are wondering if they identify as light workers, it's those who have come to be focused on raising the consciousness, the vibration, the love on the planet. Now here's where I think it can get confusing. You will still be a human being, you will still have your ups and downs, you will still have your challenges and your growth. You do not have to be a perfect person or not still be working on yourself, or not still learning new things all the time. But you have a focus on bringing healing, love, connection, spirituality, practical help to the world. And so some people 
are aware that they're a light worker. And some people you might just look at and go, oh, she's a complete light worker because she's always running around the community, helping everybody. She's always got time for whoever needs her. She may or may not really focus on that term, but the Z's really gave this message for those people who are either questioning, am I one? Um, mm -hmm. And they really gave the message to help you stay aligned because it can be a tough job and it can be one where people give their power away, overgive to others, don't look after themselves. So that's really what they address in that chapter. Yeah, and I heard something very beautiful last week with all the many times light workers are very sensitive and very empathic and they struggle a lot with uh, what we were talking about before, the politics of the day, you know, that half the world is still in wars or the climate um, crisis that we do have. And this understanding that if you're a light worker, it's kind of like, well, where else, if you are a star, where else are you going to be? But kind of there in that muddy muck to bring in that higher frequency. And oddly enough, I don't know if I'm just a strange one, but it relaxed me. I didn't feel like anymore I had to fix anything. I felt like I could just um, settle in with this idea. Okay, it's like the lotus moment, right? We can grow in the mud and and just be there and blossom and, and shine. And, and like you said, I think that's very important for all of us, all of us on the path to realize also as healers and light workers, um, that we're all continuing to heal and grow and explore and um, that it's a never ending beautiful journey of yeah, stepping it up. You know? We're going to take a little break, Lee, right? We'll be back in a couple of minutes with Lee Harris talking more about the voice, transformational healing, sound consciousness and all those good things. Conscious lifestyle to your world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free. AscendingHearts.com My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio, and we'll explore these topics and so much more on Destination Unlimited. Imagine being fired because of who you love. Imagine being denied medical treatment because of who you marry. Imagine being evicted because of who you are. Millions of Americans don't have to imagine this. They have to live it. Because in 31 states, it's legal to discriminate against LGBT people. Get the facts at beyondido.org. Brought to you by the Gill Foundation and the Ad Council. Everybody, I'm Cara Johnson, and we are at Voice Rising in studio with the author and medium Lee Harris. And Lee, I was going to ask you this question. The infinite is everywhere and energy speaks all the time. Why is channeling so important at this time in history? Well, I, I, I'm always a big believer that channeling is a really important part of a balanced diet. You know, I have seen people who only lean on channeling um, as their spiritual connection and, and they can be imbalanced as a result. But equally, mm -hmm. I've seen people separate themselves from the idea of channeling. So 
I, as, as you and probably many of your listeners know, Cara, we're channeling when we create music, we're channeling when we create art, we're, we're channeling in the kitchen, uh, co-creating what we're cooking. So to me, channeling is, is happening all the time in that we're merging with and flowing with other energy in the universe to create things, make things, bring things through us. Um, I believe that why it's so important right now that people get in touch with channeling for themselves, and I don't necessarily mean just listening to the channeling of others, I, I mean directly asking your higher self for some words of wisdom, tuning into a wisdom voice, writing down a few guided sentences for yourself, which you may or may not feel are coming through a guide. Um, you may just feel that they are just your wisest part of your yourself. It doesn't really matter where you focus to get this voice through, but having that higher wisdom voice is really important at this time because we are in a period where um, intuition and the sensory are coming back online in a bigger way. And so if you don't have some development of your own inner connection, it can be very easy to kind of get led by everyone else's. So I'm a big believer of using teachers, books, um, whatever form it takes to help us open. But I'm also a believer of now try it for yourself and see see mm -hmm. what it's like for you. You know, I think if you're the kind of person who loves visiting galleries and looking at other people's art, you must go and buy some canvas and some paint and see what happens just because mm -hmm. you might be surprised. Um, so so that that to me is is the importance of channeling at this time. And I think it becoming something that's just a bit more normal and a little less mystified, mystical um, or separate from us. Exactly. It's going to be, uh, there are going to be a lot of artist dates happening after this, <laughs> after this radio show. <coughs> oh, sorry, I have a cough. <coughs> Excuse me. You also say in the Bless book, you. Energy Speaks, that recognizing and owning your personal sense of power is one of the most important steps that we as late workers can take. And what do you mean by this? How can we recognize our power and then live that power in the world? Well, you mentioned at the top of the call um, my narcissist. Uh, so I, I did a whole course called Empaths Narcissists, um, and um, it, it's called A Power Dynamic and How to Recover from It. Because I think it, you know, we have to be a little careful with the word narcissist at the moment because it seems like that, that label is getting slapped on everybody. And um, of course, what I really talk about in the course, and there's also a free YouTube video that's an hour long where I really go into detail about it, um, it's a dynamic. And there could be someone in your life that you are giving your power away to. Um, and this is the dynamic that underlies an empath narcissist role. Um, but there could also be someone in your life that's giving you power. And we all have all these different roles. Um, but it, it can be a tendency with healers, sensitives, empaths to overly focus on the other and to overly focus on the other for reasons of either wanting to help or heal others or um, a lack of knowing your own identity. You're so empathic, you don't really know where you, where you begin and uh, where others end and you begin. So that's really what the chapter Personal Power is about. And and um, I, I also really relate to it because I think I, I think I was giving my power away in so many areas mm -hmm. for a long time. But I also, I will also say there were other areas I was owning my power. So mm -hmm. I think it's always interesting to explore the gray. Um, if ever we're making things too black and white, we're often missing the gray area in ourselves or in the situation. And um, personal power really is uh, the message in the book is to really come to know yourself and understand yourself and own yourself as much as you can. So that when you're in a relationship or a dynamic with someone else, you know when things feel right for you and your soul versus being hijacked by the agendas of others or some agenda that you're running in your mind that you must serve others first and abandon yourself. Right, and it's also an, a profound responsibility that we have when we really do tap into that power that we have within 
we carry a big responsibility for our actions then, right? A lot well, of people yeah, are nervous I, about living their power. Oh, definitely. And, and I think also sensitive people can sometimes be scared to express themselves because they can be so finely tuned to how other people express themselves. Um, let's say you had a very um, angry parent you know, mm -hmm. you might have suppressed your own fire and your own anger because you, you feel the burn in your body still of how mm -hmm. it was when they were impactful. So therefore you've quashed yourself. But just to kind of spin this personal power thing another way, because I know many people listening will be parents and you said you are, Cara. Mm -hmm. um, when you're a parent, if you are responsible for your child, your child is young, you know you're going home, you're going to feed them, that's that's what you're doing that night. If a friend comes along and says, oh, Cara, Cara, come to the fairground with me right now, it's adults only day. And mm -hmm. you go, well, I, I can't, I've got my child. They go, oh, don't worry, just leave them at home. You don't go, yeah, okay, I'll just leave them at mm -hmm. home. I'll give them a box of cereal and I'll, I'll see you tomorrow, love. <laughs> you know, you, you don't do that, you know, because you're... Right you're very clear about your role and I think that one of what I what I'm not a parent in this life um, I have mem many memories of lots of kids around me but um, I I hear from all the friends who are parents that becoming a parent really teaches you at a very deep level about responsibility to self responsibility to other love to other the challenge of that role as well as the gift of that role and most parents I know when they come out the other side when their kids are grown they will talk about well I learned how to look after another being and now I'm applying that to myself at an all-new level so I, mm -hmm. I think that's a fascinating relationship that really shows you a parent knows where its responsibility lies and will not deviate from that because of the will of others they have this commitment to the child and I think if we as sensitives can develop that same level of parenting of ourselves and all the aspects in us, then we learn to only say yes to the things that feel right to our body and to us versus perhaps many years of saying yes to someone else's will or desire when actually our body wanted us to say no. Yeah, I think that's very true. And also many parents, they do, you have to put certain needs aside at times, if your child is, for example, sick in the middle of the night, you can't just say, well, I'm going to sleep. It doesn't matter, mm -hmm. right? It, yeah, it doesn't matter. Look after it, yourself it, we we do a lot of sacrificing look. of our own or overriding or uh, there's a lot of stretching, I think, of, of um, caring and really going deeper and loving unconditionally and all these things. And then it brings me to this wonderful practice that you share in your new book, Energy Speaks, which is a three-week commitment to self-love, which I think a lot of people in all stages of their lives, but especially many parents that I know, and, and definitely it's a theme that I can continue to deepen with myself, with so many clients, and you know, and, and being a parent and everything, to remember to really honor and feed our own self-love practice. And maybe you can share a little bit more about why self-love is so important. Well, I think that, that that kind of flows perfectly from what we've just been saying. You know, I think, again, self-love is, is a word that has become very um, mainstream now. And funnily enough, because I know you're in Berlin, it was in Berlin that I delivered that workshop in 2010 and it mm. was a two-day focus um, on self-love and that's what that chapter is extracted from one of the channels that happened over that weekend in fact it's a hybrid of a few of the channels and again it goes back to personal power our ability to self-love and self-care is a direct reflection of either how we were loved and cared for when we were growing and or how we have learned to repair and heal the areas that we perhaps weren't loved or cared for and if they were showing up in us as adults in ways that were causing us problems so for example you're a neglected child um, you you learn to neglect yourself and, and ne neglect your needs and perhaps you get into dynamics with other people where 
it's all about them. So you do end up being in more narcissistic relationships with other people because you don't know how to love yourself or look after yourself. So you will just give your will, your energy, your time over to others. So active self-love is when we, if you like, parent our inner child, parent our inner self, and to wake up one morning and let's say you have a really heavy schedule and lots of commitments that day, and you, you, you just feel it in your body, it's like, oh no, I don't want to do all this. It's a very self-loving act to perhaps phone your friend and say, you know what, I, I realize we just need to reschedule tonight because I'm really... I've got a really overwhelming day and I'm tired. Can we do that? And mm -hmm. um, it's amazing to me how many people I meet who won't do that because they haven't even learned to honor the stress in the body um, mm -hmm. and know to take an action step, which is, oh, I can learn how to speak my truth without fear of retri retribution, rejection. So this is this is very layered stuff. And to me, the self-love journey has been a lifelong learning the three-week challenge that the guides give in the book, it's challenging, <laughs> having done it. <laughs> it's quite hard to uh, to spend um, three weeks um, to, to just devote some time every day across three weeks to taking a loving, kind action toward yourself that's not to do with other people, that's just to do with you taking yourself into the garden to meditate for 30 minutes. And and yet, what I realized through the doing of it is it's really not that challenging. We just haven't necessarily been trained to focus our attention that way and to fill up our own cup every day. So that's something that's much more normal in my life now. But I can think back to times in my life where I would run myself ragged um, with the demands of others or um, just n not be very good at catching when I was overwhelmed and when... I needed to put my own oxygen mask on first. So I think that chapter really dives deep on why we don't and how to do it. And we can definitely reset our vibrational frequency. I think we get a big boost in energy when we do take what we perceive maybe to be sleep time or quiet time or um, creative time or just allows, allowing ourselves to go to that gallery or to listen to a good concert. And then we realize, wow, you know, we, we might perceive it as not working in the business or not, you know, not running ourselves ragged. And are we allowed to do this? And amazingly enough, we have so much more energy if we do it. So we're coming to the so, end of I our beautiful. Say, I love that you said, yeah. are we allowed? Because that's that was so the voice in my head. And I'm sure everyone will relate yeah. to that. Isn't it funny as a society? We we, we've got that Crazy. voice. Are we allowed? Are we allowed to do this? It's yeah. brilliant. Yeah, are we allowed? Are we allowed? What words of encouragement <laughs> do you offer others who are empathic and very sensitive? You are allowed. Yeah. <laughs> you are allowed to be. You are allowed. And, and you are allowed to have your own experience here as much as you might feel like the noise of the world or the noise of others drowns out the voice of your own soul. Um, it, sometimes it's really challenging to find our own soul or align with our own soul, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't steer in that direction. So, um, yeah, you are allowed to have the unique life that you feel you are here to have while mm. still positively affecting others. And the irony is, and this is something I've learned uh, over a real trial and error process, is actually that the happier you are and the more you are doing things that light you up, the more flow will happen in your life. But trusting that that's a truth can be can take some time to un, to unpick and uncover the parts of ourselves that have kind of got into either an energy slavery to others or to beliefs that aren't quite true anymore, that have really become outdated in us. So yeah, you are allowed. You are allowed. You are allowed. That's going to be our little <laughs> mojo, our little mantra. You are allowed. And um, phenomenal also, again, to realize that whether it's the thoughts, the intentions, the affirmations, the belief systems, the feelings, I'm always telling people our voice is a portal. It is a door between our inner and outer worlds. It, it touches every single cell in our body, and then it expands out into the world, right? So with your teachings, uh, you are literally, and all of us, uh, the voice goes 
you know, we don't hang it on the wall. It literally goes into the bodies. We get to carry those voices with us wherever we go. If you had a, well, what? let's put it like this. You do have this new book, Energy Speaks, and if the readers could take something away from your book besides maybe on top of you are allowed, what would it be? <laughs> what would it be, Lee? Do you have a, a would, quick yeah. vision for this world? Yeah. I, I do. I really hope that when people encounter this book that they come away with more of an innate knowing uh, that that energy is everywhere, it's all around us, and that there are signs and signals that are constantly showing us that connection that we all have to the energy around us. Because when we have that connection, we're more awake, we're more open, we have a more expanded life and a more expanded experience. So. To me, I'm hoping that that's what people take away from the book. Fabulous. And do you have a homepage if they want to get in touch with yes, you? Yes, it's leeharrisenergy.com. Excellent. It's been a great pleasure to have you on the show. I Thank wish you, you so much, much success Cara. right, with Thank all you. your endeavors. And we Thank are you. very lucky to have you incarnated on the earth, not only with your voice, Lee Harris, but with the voices of the Zs that like to dance and speak through you. Thank you so much for all you're doing. It's been a real honor. Bye-bye.